And now we turn our discussion to the future of food from our panelists. So I've always said that food may be one of the most relatable investment areas, as at the very least, every one of us has eaten breakfast this morning, um, or so I hope to substantially carry us through this day. I want to welcome our panelists, Rachel Drury, founder and CEO of one of our portfolio companies, Daily Harvest, a subscription-based delivery of farm-fresh organic fruits and vegetables made into delicious and nourishing smoothies, soups, oats, lattes, ice cream, and more. And Nick Green, co-founder and CEO of Thrive Market, another of our portfolio companies, an online membership-based market of more than half a million members who support better brands and seek to build a better world in the process and Seth Goldman, co-founder of Eat the Change, a platform to inform and empower consumers to make dietary choices consistent with their concerns around climate change, uh, as well as, as co-founder of Plant Burger, a fast casual restaurant concept with a menu designed by chef Spike Mendelson, dedicated to crafting and redefining some of America's favorite foods without using animal products, but not sacrificing flavor. This panel will be moderated by my colleague, Gotham Gupta, investment partner at M13. And now welcome to all of you. Gotham, take it away. All right, Tara, thanks for the introduction. Um, and Christine, thank you for an excellent panel. I think we were all just slacking each other that the bar has now been raised, so the pressure is on. Um, but uh, very excited um, for this panel. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the future of food, food is an incredibly exciting place to be right now. Um, you know, everyone on the, the panel today um, has really been a pioneer in their own way um, in innovating uh, in the food industry. Um, but, you know, before we start talking about the future of food, uh, I wanted to start with the past um, and just get a sense uh, of, you know, looking at the last 10 years of food innovation, I would argue that it's been predicated uh, by innovation in plant-based foods um, and really a drive towards organic and natural food. Um, I would love for each of you to maybe talk about, you know, first, do you agree with that? Do you, do you think that there have been other things that are driving the food industry? Um, and I guess the, the, the main uh, question that I'd love to spend the time on is, do you think that's going to be true for the next 10 to 20 years? Um, so I'm not sure who wants to start here. Uh, maybe, um, you know, Nick, if, if you could uh, uh, start us off. Sure. Um, so I, I have a very biased perspective. Uh, we're on a mission to make you know, healthy, organic food sustain, uh, sustainable and accessible to every American family. Uh, so clearly, I do believe in the mass secular trend. Um, it's been pretty interesting, though, in our business over the last six years, just since we launched, uh, to see how much that trend has evolved. So just speaking to your point, uh, it has been, um, it's been incredible. Like there were things that we were, we were, we were thinking about at the very beginning that consumers weren't really att attuned to uh, that are now front and center for almost every consumer, right? Regenerative was not even on the map. Uh, organic was a nice to have a luxury, um, you know, non-GMO was something that a lot of people weren't that aware of. You know, the, the, the term glyphosate wasn't in the vernacular. Uh, for most people. Um, so I think there has been a transformation over the last five to 10 years. Um, and I think we're in the first out of the first inning. You know, it's like any trend that starts small. When you look at uh, organic as a percentage of CPG sales or percentage of food sales, we're still looking at single digits. So it's got a lot of room to run. Uh, and I think that what we're seeing is that people uh, are, regardless of their income level, regardless of where they live, regardless of all the different factors that may have predisposed people to being focused on organic in the past, uh, I think uh, are, are starting to, to move in. Yeah, we see that in our business and that's obviously part of our mission. Uh, but to give you a sense, our percentage of the membership base that come from the Midwest and the Southeast has just continued to crescendo. It is now over 50% of our membership base. You know, average household income has continued to come down. Uh, so we're now very much after middle class, middle Americans uh, with average household income of 75,000. Uh, and then of course the size of the membership base continues to climb. So we'll, we'll reach over a million members this year. So. Um, I think it's I think it's just getting started, and I think the big question is, you know, are there things that innovators and brands and retailers can do uh, to accelerate that trend by making it more accessible, by making it more affordable, and making it easier? Awesome, Rachel. What what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, over the past ten years, the fact that that. Um, you know, fifty one percent of us just said in the poll that we're focused on that we think the future 
is health and and wellness, I think is a is a really important indicator that this is not the beginning. This is this is not early end. I mean, sorry, that this is just the beginning. We are in early innings, um, and there's so much more to do. And it's not just organic. It's really, um, you know, as Nick was saying, there's there's regenerative practices. There's also like a return to food being less processed. Right. We went through this phase of food industrialization where food became something that was so process that your body stopped knowing what to do with it. Um, and there's been a trend towards undoing some of the harm that that's done to our health. Um, you know, but, and, and as more people are learning about the benefits of adopting plant-based eating habits and, you know, organic farming practices, both for themselves and for the, the planet, frankly, like these trends are going to re reach critical mass. Um, you know, definitely trick trickling beyond early majority and, um, and late adopters. Uh, you know, as, as Nick also alluded to this, but, you know, organic represents 1% of our farmland and 4% of food sales in the U.S., but at least 20% of people buy organic as part of their routine. So, you know, you just think about the opportunity there and it's, it's big, um, you know, and, and the way to get there, the way to, to meet demand and to, to make it more accessible is to increase that demand. So, you know, investing in things like transitional organics and, um, you know, unprocessed food and regenerative farming and um, even biodiversity, like only 12 plants and five animals make up 75% of the world's food supply. Like that's bananas. So there's just, there's a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of, of trends that have, have just kind of bubbled up over the last 10 years that, you know, we're, we're definitely still in early on, innings on. Yeah, that's super interesting. I guess a quick, quick yes or no question here um, before we change gears, but uh, do either of you think that it's possible we may see more, you know, almond milk or nut milk sold in, in this country than dairy milk? Like, do you think that that's a possibility that we may get to? I'll say yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, the, like we've, we have literally seen, as I said before, trends that just weren't even in the vocabulary that are now mega trends. You know, I'll give an example from a diet standpoint, keto. Had anybody heard of keto five years ago? Uh, and you look at the Google search uh, trends on keto and it's just like, it didn't exist. And now it's like the, the predominating diet that's bigger than the next 10 diets combined. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but trends also do come and go. So, you know, I, I don't know about almond milk, but I would definitely say plant-based milk, yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, Seth, thank you. Uh, Hi, thank everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, so I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the economy. Um, you know, I think what we are uh, about to go through from a recession uh, standpoint is, is you know, very unique and very, very different from sort of past economic downturns. Um, you know, we're all at home, um, likely cooking a lot more. Um, as we saw from the survey, people are thinking a lot more about uh, the products that they're putting in their bodies and, and thinking a lot more about health. Um, I'd love to, to just hear your commentary on how are you thinking about this recession impacting uh, the food industry? Um, and specifically, maybe if you could comment on just, um, you know, interesting ways that it's already impacted. COVID has already kind of impacted your businesses. Um, Seth, maybe we'll start with you and, and uh, come around from there. Sure. So I think this is a much bigger moment than, I mean, yes, there is an economic recession going on, but I think there really is a whole recalibration going on around uh, our diets and the way we think about food. And I think that, you know, this is now, uh, there's a moment of connectedness or a recognition that there's a connectedness going on so that, you know, the choices we make do have impacts. You, know, you can't, deny, as much as some have tried to deny it over previous years, it's, it's undeniable now. You know, what somebody does in China has an impact on our diet. What we do here has an impact on the other side of the planet. And I think that's uh, a, a bigger trend than, you know, obviously a, a serious economic downturn. I don't, I don't want to minimize it, but I think that's going to be a bigger driver of how people will make food choices. I certainly, I, it's both a, it's a, both a belief and a hope that that, <laughs> that we're at a moment of transition. And I think the sense of connectedness can lead to real um, powerful change. And I think, you know, certainly the businesses that I'm involved in, uh, Plant Burger and this new brand, Eat the Change, are all about both recognizing that moment and hopefully accelerating that transition as well. 
Yeah. And do you, Seth, maybe if we can stay on you just for a second, yeah. um, uh, given retail locations are closed, grocery stores are running out of stock of things. I mean, yeah. is there any, um, even just near term, um, you know, ways that, that it, maybe it's caused you to think differently? Oh, yeah, this? totally. Well, the, the, look, the, the, what it's exposed is some broken business models. The, the restaurant business model is broken. Think about this. You've got people who are paying real estate for seats that they can't fill. Uh, they're not allowed to fill. And even if there's no, no one in those seats, they still have to pay the landlord a fixed rent uh, and no matter what happens. And so what we've done at Plant Burger, we have uh, five locations or the next one's opening up next week. Um, they're all located inside of Whole Foods and it's a dynamic rent model. So we pay rent based only on um, a percentage of sales. And so, you know, that's, if I'm a restaurateur, if I have a choice between that or paying a fixed number every month, I think that's how it's going to have to ship. So, um, you know, we've heard that over a third of restaurants are going to go out of business uh, just, or, or have, if they haven't already gone out of business, will go out of business. And, and it's just been brutal. Uh, and so you've got to look at different business models. And I think that's a small example, but obviously you're seeing the same phenomenon happen in office real estate, right? Why, why would an office be paying to house all these people who can't work in it? Um, so a lot of things are going to change. And, and, you know, the one thing I'd say, anyone whose business model and business plan hasn't changed uh, from January is failing to recognize what's happening. Cool. Very well said. Um, Rachel, uh, how, about, uh, how about you? What do you think in terms of uh, the impact of this recession on daily harvest and kind of how you're thinking about uh, consumer changes? Yeah, I, I mean, in general, consumers are home. They're busier than ever. Plant parents are juggling work, school, daycare, all while trying to stay healthy. I mean, I have two kids at home, and it is it is insane. <laughs> let's just let's just leave that there. Um, you know, convenient people need convenient solutions to feed themselves and their families, and they need things that don't require them to leave their home. That's just where we are. So, you know, when you think about this recession in particular, all these factors are coming together to create an environment that's ripe for online food and grocery companies. Um, you know, brands with technology and delivery infrastructure are going to win. Um, and then you think about like health as an investment area, which we already spoke about a little bit, you know, health is no longer discretionary. So when you think about how, yeah. um, how people are going to spend those dollars that they have, if they lose their job, you know, it's going to be about health and quality. People are seeing the the divide and, and COVID outcomes between the healthy and the not healthy. Yeah. Um, the proof is there. And, you know, past recessions, yeah, people ate at home. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is a different dynamic this time where um, it's almost not a choice. Yeah. So you have to find ways to make it work for you. And, and there's more demands on, on all of us than ever before. And, um, you know, I think that people need solutions that fit a new lifestyle. Um, and, it's going to, there's going to be a big impact, but as I said, you know, it's, it's about taste, health, sustainability. Um, those are going to be the winners. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, I mean, Nick, uh, you know, couldn't think of a business that's probably better positioned right now being the whole foods kind of whole foods delivered to your door. I imagine though that, um, COVID has, uh, changed a lot of how you guys are thinking about, um, you know, the business and, you've always had a very strong value message to uh, Thrive Market. Um, maybe you could just talk about, you know, are you um, uh, extending that messaging and, and really uh, driving uh, sort of value harder or are there other things that, that COVID has changed in, in your plans? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, Rachel made, made the point and I think it's really true that the, the, this recession, like every recession is gonna have people focused on value and convenience and affordability. Um, we're obviously positioned as a wholesale buying club where you're going to get the organic natural products at or below the price of conventional equivalents. Uh, that's a tailwind for us. Um, but as, as both Seth and Rachel pointed out, what we're looking at is something very different than your typical recession. Um, and, you know, we've seen that really acutely during, during the actual, during the actual pandemic, pandemic itself. So you've got the obvious acceleration of the trend towards purchasing uh, from home, uh, grocery shopping online. And the, you know, the data that you see there is the stats are just amazing. It's like really like we've seen, it's not just like a year's acceleration. It's like five years acceleration in the course of three or four months, which is, you know, really zooming out totally unprecedented. Uh, and then the, the other side, which, which has been pointed out is this, this shift, uh, kind of this, what I would describe as an instant 
uh, becoming of conscious consumers for many people. Um, and I think there's two dimensions to that. One of them is around, uh, as Rachel pointed out, safety uh, and health and trust. Uh, it's no longer discretionary. Um, and I think that is something that was, again, accelerated through COVID, but was already happening. Right? When you look at it, it wasn't just COVID that is affected by lifestyle, right? Type 2 diabetes, obesity, like all these things that are comorbidities with COVID are major issues for our, for our country and for, for millions of people independent of COVID. And so I think that's what's been driving long-term, a secular trend that I was describing earlier of more and more people from all over the country, all different backgrounds wanting to get healthy. And, and obviously that's what we're betting on. I think the only, the other, the other trend though that I would point to, which I think is really important is, uh, is people wanting to live their values. Um, and I think uh, Seth sort of alluded to this in this coming together moment, but I think, you know, COVID has been this moment where people get, are taking, taking stock, getting perspective, thinking about what's really important. And it's been interesting on Thrive to see, you know, we launched a COVID relief fund uh, and we saw a donated checkout rise 9X uh, in the course of three days. Um, and we've raised over half a million dollars for COVID relief, all from the Great. generosity of our members. So people are wanting to vote with their dollars. Uh, again, that trend was already happening, but I think it's just accelerated now. And my hope is that, you know, like the shift online, we're going to see an acceleration of conscious consumerism that also accelerates, you know, half a decade or a decade, uh, because we need that when we're facing, you know, existential planetary uh, issues. Amen. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Th thank you guys for all the work that, that you're doing on that. Um, I want to stay on this topic, actually, because one of the things that's really important now is, you know, if health is so important to consumers, um, I think access couldn't be uh, sort of more important today. Um, how do you provide, you know, with joblessness numbers uh, at record highs, how do you provide access to these healthier, better for you options um, that historically have had the perception of being more expensive, right? Um, and often are, you know, more expensive. Um, and so Nick, maybe we can actually stay on you because Thrive Market has been a pioneer um, ever since, I think, day one of uh, really building access into uh, the values of the company. Um, and so I'd love for you to maybe just talk about what you guys have done historically and, and how you're thinking about access right now. Yeah. So, I mean, step one is affordability. I mentioned that a few different times, but when, when organic or simple non-processed foods cost twice as much or even 50% more than conventional, mm -hmm. you're just going to eliminate huge swaths of the market. So, you know, Whole Foods built a $14 billion business doing a lot of amazing things for raising standards, but they were only accessible to about 5% of American income earners. Um, and so the affordability barrier has to be broken down. We do that with our membership model. Um, now, our membership is 60 bucks a year. We have almost a million paying members. There's also millions of Americans who can't afford that, right, or aren't willing to make that leap. So we also donate a free membership for every paid member on the site. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, a big, that's, a, that's a big deal. Affordability is the first one. The second one, I think, is, is just like physical access, like just straight geography. Um, mm -hmm. That's becoming an even more acute issue now is it's not just can I drive 20 miles to the grocery store, but can I even leave my home? Uh, but just to like, share some perspective there, even pre-COVID, you know, over half of American families are not within driving distance of a health food retailer. So there are millions and millions of American families that live in health food deserts or what I've, I've heard called health food swamp or food swamps. Um, they have food access, but they don't have healthy food access. So I think that's a major issue. And, you know, whether it's daily harvest shipping to your door or it's the market, that ability to, to change distribution matters. Um, and then I think the last thing, which actually gets less attention, uh, but is, is just as important and uh, there's a lot of opportunity from a technology side to try to solve is just the, the, the difficulty, the kind of like ease of finding healthy options. So, you know, I, I learn about the keto option or I find out I've got type two diabetes or I have a kid with a nut allergy. How am I going to go into the grocery store, assuming I can actually get to the grocery store and find products that actually meet my diet? Um, how can I, you know, find, get products recommended to me that are going to be the right thing based on things I've bought in the past? And I think online, we've got a really incredible ability, especially for those of us that are building platforms purpose-built for healthy living to solve that problem. And I think even if you solve the affordability and the geography issue, if we can't solve that, if we can't make it easy for people that have so many other concerns in their lives, uh, we're not gonna be able to really shift that transition. So that's where a lot of our focus is. And um, you know, I'm a daily harvest user. And part of the reason that I do it is it's easy. I just pop those meals in the, in the microwave. I got it on auto subscribe. Uh, and I get, you know, meals recommended. So, so it makes a ton of sense. And I think we think a lot about that experience 
as that that last barrier to knock down to get people using the getting healthy. Yeah, I, I think so many of us are going to have a daily harvest for lunch today. So um, <laughs> Rachel's a, a popular person in, in the M13 family. Um, Seth, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on yeah. sort of access, you know, beyond plant burger. How are you guys thinking sure. about this? And No, it's it's the big, it's the, it is a key challenge. And so one thing we just actually today uh, released a, a wave of grants to what we're calling our change makers. And these are community-based nonprofits that are working to democratize planet-friendly food. So one really um, exciting example is a, is a, a woman in South, South LA who is setting up a vegan organic grocery. And, uh, you know, yes, it is absolutely on its own uh, an important way to provide it food access, but it, it just having the food there and having it at a affordable price isn't enough. You also need uh, education, you know, you need inspiration, you need to find ways to connect with the community from the community. And so this, this is a really exciting kind of model and we're looking to support more of those. Um, and because, you know, a brand man, a brand maker can do so much, a retail, uh, uh, you know, a certainly online model uh, <clears throat> can only do so much, but if we can interact with people in the community, uh, have members of their community educating them, that is a, will be a, a key piece of, of making this happen. Cool. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna, I, I wanna switch gears and, and maybe have you address um, kind of be the, the first uh, uh, person to speak on, on this next topic, which is you know, food and technology have become very intertwined, right? Um, just, I think last week or two weeks ago, uh, there was a company that announced they've created a 3D printer that prints edible proteins, right? So you could effectively print, um, you know, a some version of a steak uh, out of a 3D printer. Um, how much is kind of too much? Uh, is is this, you know, sort of an area that we're just going to see more of? Like, is food going the way of synthetic? Yeah. So I'm I'm very vocal on this topic, as you know, but. Um, you know, at, at a personal level, level, I just don't believe in using technology to synthesize food. Like we've already done that and we've seen what happens. Um, study after study points to the fact that the closer foods are to their natural state, the healthier they are for us um, and the better we can metabolize them. So, you know, as companies explore new uncharted ter territory, I just, I think that we need a lot of transparency and we need a lot of studies and we need to understand more. Um, GMO labeling laws in the U.S. don't even apply to products made using synth synthetic biology, um, and it makes it really tough for customers to make them make informed choices. And you know, I am completely on board for for people you know living a plant based life, but I don't think that it needs to. I think that like you can eat plants. You know, you don't need to meet to eat um, things that are are made in a printer. Um, you know, and I think it's really important that we use technology for that transparency. Like overall, there's just a, a general lack of public information and transparency from so many companies about their processes, what their supply chains will look like, um, especially when they get to scale. And this just leaves a lot of unanswered questions for me about the self safety and, and you know, the ultimate environmental, economic and, and social sustainability of these products. So if I could, I have a, a very, uh bipolar response on this because, uh, you know, honesty, obviously organic, uh, fair trade certified, total transparency, uh, eat the change. The new brand that we're launching will also be very much, uh, products, you know, from, from nature delivered organically and emphasizing biodiversity. Um, and I talk about honesty and eat the change as an example of an undoing of food, you know, real simple, transparent supply chains. But also uh, as chair of the board of Beyond Meat, you know, that is a company that is applying technology, but I'd like to say that's a redoing of food in a transparent and authentic way. And what I mean by that is it is non-GMO certified. Um, it is, uh, is you know, simple and clear ingredients that, that people are able to understand. And I do believe uh, compared to the meat analogs, it is healthier for people. So I do think there's a role for technology when it can be done in a way that is safe for the consumer, better for the environment. And when you can document that it uses 99% less water, 93% less land, and of course, 0% uh, dead animal. Uh, I think that's a better thing for the, um, the consumer and for the planet. So I think there's a role for technology when it can be applied in a way that is transparent and where there are um, clear benefits for the consumer and for the planet. Yeah, so maybe more of a, a, a decision of choice um, and, and consumer choice. 
Well, I, I think you never should lose sight of, of transparency, just as Rachel said. Um, I'm, I, I think that is there that you can go pretty quickly down a, a bad hill <laughs> when you start, um, you know, rationalizing places of te uh, where technology can um, have a role. And so I think you do want to be careful. But I do think it, certainly if, as, if we think about trying to convert our population to more plant based diets, I think products like Beyond Meat are, are critical for that. And uh, it's unrealistic to expect people are going to go from uh, meat intensive, animal based meat to total plant diets without some kind of a, a, a transition or gateway product. And I think an example uh, of Beyond Meat can, can is play a major role. I think what's, if I can add in here, I think what's so exciting right now, and Seth, you're sort of alluding to this, and uh, when you talk about choice and transparency, is consumers are so much more aware than they ever have been. And they have access to more information at their fingertips. And it's not just the information being fed to them by commercials from big CPG. You know, they're able to, to you know, follow health and wellness influencers on social media that are doing their mm -hmm. own research and you know, taking a grassroots approach. And there's obviously a whole conversation around information and disinformation on social media. But I yeah. think you know, net net, our consumers today are more conscious, they care more, uh, and they're more empowered. And I think what's really exciting is you can have this debate over, you know, is Beyond Meat the path towards uh, a, a more sustainable future? Is regenerative ag a path or are both different paths? And, you know, we can take advantage of kind of the marketplace of ideas and let consumers actually make that decision. And it may be that for different consumers, different solutions uh, work or right, there's one solution in the short term, one solution in the long term. So, you know, I, I, I would just echo Rachel's point about transparency and say that is so, so important. And as food innovators, if we can create and thrive, what we're trying to create as a platform that really empowers members to vote with their dollars, to live their values, that gives them the information about where the, where the food comes from, um, that connects them to influencers and to thought leaders who can inform, inspire, and educate them. Um, and then that provides both, right? That, that provides, provides options that uh, you know, get them towards where, where they wanna be. And the fact is we've gone off in such a bad direction, we're gonna need multiple paths to a better Absolutely. place. And, yeah. and the good news is that people want to get there, right? And it's yeah. broad. It's not just a, a niche of people like mainstream middle class, middle America wants to get healthier and they want our planet to get healthier. So I want to finish on, on one question before we kind of turn it over to the audience, which is, um, you know, thinking again, the theme of the, the day is future of. Um, and so thinking of one potential innovation uh, that is coming uh, that could have a fundamental impact on your business, I would love for you to maybe just comment, what is one innovation um, that, that you're excited about that, that could fundamentally change your businesses? Uh, maybe, uh, Seth, we can start with you. Sure. I, I, if you will, I'll, I'll just give you two quickly. The first is that, you know, as I said, restaurants have changed, that the, that, that old model is broken. So restaurants and the way we access food service will be different. So, um, and that's exciting. The other one I'll say, and this is just a teaser, but uh, the mushrooms are coming. And uh, <laughs> big believer. What, what kind? Psychedelic or? <laughs> all kinds. Edible all mushrooms, all kinds, all kinds. Big believer in it and look forward to sharing uh, what we're going to be doing with those. You know, that's a great teaser of uh, uh, we the next uh, the next future of event. Uh, perfect. Every, um, everyone will take mushrooms before. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. Uh, Nick, how about you? I mean, I'll, I'll echo the mushrooms just as a as a to tell you how of the moment they are. You know, we're a lot about to launch a blended burger that is thirty percent mushrooms, uh, you know, sustainably sourced mushrooms and seventy percent grass fed beef. Um, you know, again, kind of go back to that question of beyond meat versus other alternatives. Mm -hmm. This is one alternative. And, you know, I tried it the other day and I it was, I could not tell that it was meat except for that I didn't feel so full. Um, and that, by the way, is why I like a beyond, beyond meat burger better than a traditional beef burger. Uh, so I think that's one. The other one that we're really passionate about is packaging innovation. And I think you can think a lot about food innovation, yeah. but, uh, and, uh, you know, coincidentally, this can tie to mushrooms too. Uh, we're, we're looking at, at compostable packaging that actually uses mushrooms, but uh, the world where we can get to compostable packaging, packaging that is cheap and functional, which, you know, if you would have asked me two years ago, I would have said is 10 years off. Now I think it's like two years off. Um, it's just amazing the acceleration of progress that's happening there. And food waste is one issue, but packaging waste, especially in a world that's shifting towards e-commerce, is a massive problem that we got to you know, focus our sights on. 
So, so what you're uh, saying is the second and third order ripple effects um, are invest in mushroom farms. Yeah. Uh, more or less, more or less. Going. Yeah. Um, Rachel, you cannot say mushrooms. So, so that's the <laughs> one thing I would love to hear from you, but you cannot say mushrooms. Um, okay, so I'll give you two things quickly. One, just to echo Nick, um, compostable packaging, we've already moved 50% over there and there's still work to do, but um, it is the future and it is just, it's necessary. And, um, you know, finding that perfect balance between functionality and compostability and sustainability is, is really where it's at. Um, the other thing that I get really excited about is um, from a personalization perspective, because as we've already said, match like people knowing what to eat. There's just so much noise out there. So how do you know what's right for you if you're diagnosed with you know type two diabetes? As Nick said, as Nick said, I just called you Nick. Um, as Nick said, like how do you how do you know what to do with that? How do you know what diet is right for you? And I think that there's just a lot to do um, with data science on like how to can how to how to um, you know, have, have, how to curate people's diets in a way that allows them to be healthy without the cognitive load that it usually requires to figure out how to do that. Um, and then things like using emotional AI and all of these incredible tools that are, um, that are, are bubbling up right now to be able to make that personalization better and stronger. Like not just about what food you like, but what food do you need and what is your emotional state and like, you know, what is the emotional and psychological and, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Emotional and motivational reasons for wanting certain things and how that works with um, individual tastes and needs. If, if you can ever tell me why I like mint chocolate, all the smoothie, mint chocolate smoothie or mint chocolate ice cream, that would be great. It probably speaks We're to working on it. Inner <laughs> psyche or something. So, all right, we have uh, basically one minute. So this will be like a, a you know, rapid fire round uh, audience question, um, which is narrowing it down beyond movements towards healthier foods and lifestyles. What are more micro trends that you see? So, so maybe if you could just rapid fire like one micro trend that you're excited about. Um, this is it's not like a new thing, but I think blockchain in food um, supply chain is really cool. Interesting, awesome. Like the traceability. Let's yeah, that cool. Way. Cool, Nick, Seth. Uh, I mean, micro trend. This, this is a mega trend, but it's 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 I think barely getting started. Is just people thinking about health more holistically, not just their own health, but health of the planet. And you know, we get as many inquiries today on our carbon neutral shipping as we do on free shipping. Okay. There was a time five years ago when people didn't even know what carbon ship, ship, and carbon neutral shipping wow. meant, and so that's uh, it's amazing how quickly that's happened. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, that. Yeah. Anyway, we don't have enough time, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, um, I, 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 I'm just, I love to see the continued specialization around plant-based. So, you know, obviously first it was just milk and then meat. Now you're seeing cheese, egg, and it just keeps going more and more granular. Uh, and I think that's all to the good. It, it's continual race to improve. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time. Um, this has been uh, a ton of fun and I uh, appreciate hearing all your thoughts about the, uh, the food industry. Great to be with you. Thanks, guys.